Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce Sean Jensen Gray, who will be talking about using large language models in data engineering tasks. Great. Hey, I'm Sean Jensen Gray. I'm from Google Cloud, and I'm going to talk about using large language models in data engineering tasks. Um, so the goal of this talk is really to spark your curiosity into how to use LLMs. Um, you know, we've been, we're at a crazy place right now. A lot of technology, pace of innovation is basically straight up. And uh, you might have evaluated uh, large language models um, and discounted them. I'm here to kind of like pull you back in and show you some different things that you could do. Um, and really, I'd like to encourage like different workflows um, around those. And, and then I really think that we're going to have to operate at a higher semantic level in our jobs. I think there's going to be this transformative change from low level data engineering into sort of higher level things. Um, and then I also want to kind of you know, temper the hype. You know, there's a lot of things they can't do. Um, but it also at the same time, I want to uh, sort of like uh, suppress some of the distract or detractors of, of large language models. So first of all, I'm going to go into some terminology, set the context. You know, this is a, is a beam summit. This isn't a machine learning summit. And then set some context and some, some grounding to, you know, reevaluate um, your evaluation. I, you know, uh, how many people here have uh, used large language models or, or chat language models um, in any capacity, both just... All right, it's about like two thirds of the two thirds of the, the crowd. Um, how many people use large language models on a daily or weekly basis to solve problems? All right, so about a third of the crowd. Okay, cool. Um, and then so the next thing we're going to cover is prompt engineering. Um, I don't really like the term, but I think uh, it has a lot of validity. It's the term we're going to use, so we're going to go with it. I'm going to explain all the different um, facets and, and um, you know things to, to think about there. And then we're going to go into some use cases, uh, some of the risks, and then the, the, the outro. So in terms of terminology, um, uh, an NLP, langu natural language processing, a lot of the advances we're seeing right now are all out of NLP-derived models. And LLMs is a, a large language model. And then uh, Transformer, uh, this really happened in 2017 from the Attention is All You Need paper. So the advancements that we see now, that we're all using day to day now, go back to 2017. And there have been a ton of advances since then. And those things are percolating into products and into research. But people think that like it, the thing that we're using now is really the cutting edge. It's actually quite old. And so there's all of this sort of like um, submarine research, the stuff that's under the covers that's coming. And while we, we think we evaluate where things are right now, there's this second wave and this third wave of, of other innovations that are just around the corner. And so I kind of want to put that in context in terms of you know, how old uh, transformers are. Uh, and then when we talk about GPT, that's a generative pre-trained transformer. That's the specifics um, of the model that OpenAI has taken transformers and, and sort of made their own. And then they added on top of that RLHF, so uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. This is where you take a, a, a foundational model and you add in sort of the, 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 the chat framework around it so they can now answer questions. Uh, a base LLM just... A, a, um, you know, it completes documents. It doesn't really answer questions. And so the, so the magic sauce is really taking the LLM and, you know, bolting the RLHF on top of it. And then the other thing that people talk around a lot is the, is the context window. So this is the working memory of the, of the model itself. And that can range from like 2,000 tokens to, you know, we have models now that are available that have 100,000 tokens. There's research to go, you know, beyond that 100,000 token limit. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, amazing possibilities when you can get up into those high token ranges. You can have LLMs that can basically read entire books and then respond back to you. And then for a token, think of it as roughly a word or part of a word. And so this talk is, this is about all I'm going to go into in terms of LLMs and um, the, the base machine learning aspect of it. That link and that QR code links to that, um, that video by Christopher Potts. Uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful, I think it's 30 minutes, um, maybe a little bit more, a video by a, a natural language processor, um, researcher, um, that goes over the state of LLMs now and then where they're going. So in, in terms of terminology, I'm going to refer to everything here as a chat LLM. And that's not to like not talk about chat GPT, but it's just to talk about them all in general. So when I say chat LLM, I mean BARD, I mean chat GPT, I mean Claude. And sort of Bing, but I don't really mention Bing because you have to use Edge um, to, to access it. And 
um, that's that. So, but if you're on Windows and you use Edge, have fun with Bing. Um, and so it's not going to be specific to any one technology. I want to really talk about techniques and directions as opposed to you can do this with this tool. Because um, really, it's about how you use the tools. And that's what I'm going to try and um, show people is that we have this new opportunity to have this super flexible tool that can basically do anything that we need. And we can apply it to data engineering tasks. So in a chat model, again, is a large language model with RLHF on top. So uh, while well, I said in this slide, I was going to save the, uh, the funny meme for a later slide. It's this one. Uh, so there's this meme online about the, the, the Shagath of uh, the smiley face. And that monster you see there is basically the LLM. And so LLMs are trained with, like, think of it, a terabyte, five terabytes, 10 terabytes of just text from lots of different places, PDFs, um, you know, Usenet, Reddit, Hacker News, everywhere. So it's basically just all this data just shoveled into this thing, and then you have to like sort of correct it. So you have a bunch of different layered um, models on top of it where you try to make it behave and be nice. And as people have probably seen in the you know, chat transcripts going around the internet about Bing and kind of getting unhinged, they didn't put as much effort into making it nice as maybe other, other folks have. Um, and so, but it's still all in there. Like, and then you see that little smiley face. That's the, that's the thing that you're using and the thing that admonishes you when you try to do something it doesn't like, but it's all still, it's still underneath the covers. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to understand how many layers there are and what sort of corrective effects um, are being applied to get to where we are. Now, there are, there's a ton of interesting research going on. I just saw a paper a couple days ago called er Erasure, which they can actually detect um, uh, different concepts and remove them entirely from the LLM. And then there's, there's um, you know, transfer learning. There's other different kinds of learning techniques where you can take a model and retrain another model based on existing data, getting models to relabel themselves. So there's, there's a bunch of um, you know, interesting things there. So let me start by sort of, you know, a lot of people probably used um, LLMs and they might have discounted them or think that they're only um, useful for certain kinds of things. So I want to kind of bring you back in and sort of reset that context. So I, I roughly see sort of three patterns in people I talk to. I talk to people about ChatGPT all the time. I mention ChatGPT and then somebody just walks up to me in a bar and we have a conversation about it. Um, you know, I had, to, uh, I had a conversation with somebody at another company. He was a dev manager and he wanted to lay off uh, his staff of data engineers of four people. They were all super junior. And he's like, I can do everything they can do now with this thing. And I sort of had to convince him to not do that because there's all these other uh, you know, problems around, um, you know, taking on that workload, working with stakeholders. There's things that data engineers do day by day that's not just writing code, and those things are equally as important. But the, the three patterns of evaluation that I see are, are basically, they pick it up, they, they have some sort of understanding of it, they say it's just a Markov generator, you know, they give it a really hard test um, under poor controls and say, hey, it doesn't work. And then um, somebody else might pick it up, not put a ton of effort into, into what the, the prompt is or, or play with it and say, hey, it's just a toy. Like it can do these certain things. It can talk like a pirate, you know, what have you, but it can't use it for serious work. And then the other one is, is really, it's like it's, it's, it's a new tool and it takes time to develop techniques to use new tools. So I would encourage folks to basically see, you know, start with baby steps and, and really test it and understand all the dimensions that it works in. It, it behaves like a mind, but it is not a human mind. It's, it's something else. So it will have gaps that uh, a human mind wouldn't have in the same respects, but it can exceed um, in capabilities in ways that, that a human could not. So you have to sort of have a theory of your own mind when you're using it in terms of what are you evaluating and what do you want to accomplish and, and how are you encouraging the model to help you arrive at that answer. You know, I think it's an amazing new tool, um, but it really has to be used in a, in a measured way in the right context. And I will show some context where I think it's extremely effective. Um, but what it has over humans that, it, that, that uh, no one of us could ever do is basically um, have an entire copy of the internet in, in your mind at one time. And so that also makes it extremely difficult to use in a way, because when you, when you talk to a person, 
you already have shared contacts. You know who they are, you know where they came from, you roughly know what their education is and how they work, and so you don't have to do that. When, when you're using an LLM, um, you basically have to manufacture or conjure the persona that, that is gonna answer that question for you um, out of thin air. So you have to do a lot more context setting than you would do with a, with a normal person. You might have seen this. This is from the uh, uh, folks online like to use air quotes around paper. This is from uh, basically um, a, a big document that describes GPT-4, um, but it doesn't say how it works, but it says how it performs. And apparently it performs really well across a bunch of different metrics. You've probably seen um, you know, the, the headlines about uh, it, it like getting in the top 5% for LSAT, the, the law school admission test, right? Which probably none of us could do if we until we practiced a ton, right? Um, but it's able to score very highly a bunch across the different domains. But then you try to get add some numbers and it falls down. But then at the same time, um, you know, it, it has a proclivity for being able to, you know, add and subtract, you know, 40-digit decimal numbers. So uh, its performance is is nonlinear. So um, this is my uh, my meme that I injected here in terms of you're holding it wrong. Uh, you, you really do have to hold it correctly, and you have to figure out how to make it work. And as engineers, you know, we, we solve problems and we use tools, and we have to figure out how to use the, uh, hold the tool properly to solve those problems. So, you know, it's uh, a lot of, we're, we're all experts in a particular domain, and so oftentimes when we pick up a new tool, especially this one, um, you know, we, we pick it up, we give it a really hard test, and it fails because we're in that domain. It's not going to excel um, at, at the domain that you're in because that's why you're the expert. But you're not an expert in all of these other things, and it's a generalist, and it's probably better than, better than you are at those other things. And so it can either take a novice up to somebody who's you know, more junior level, or it can basically be your, your, uh, your junior assistant coder for things that you're not so good at. So, you know, bash scripting, or else I'll show later, like, you know, generating charts with Seaborn from data frames. I don't do that every day. I, hard, I do that hardly ever. And so um, it's basically having executable documentation at your fingertips for that use case. So there's all these other things that we do as part of our job that are not exercising our domain expertise. And this can really, and really help us out. And the things that I have found it um, amazing for is it basically reduces the cognitive load uh, for doing all of these kind of hard tasks because we're outside of our element and you know we're, we're on stack overflow we're looking up documentation we're trying to find github projects that do the same thing we're in the you know we're in either in a REPL or a debugger trying to you know get these things to work um, you can have that same experience along with all those other things in addition to generating um, you know test projects and and code uh, in real time the other thing that it's amazing at is you know translating jargon every other domain. So we're in a, you're a domain expert um, for, for data engineering, but you're solving somebody else's problem. You're not solving a data engineering problem, you're solving something in real estate or finance or science, um, and you have to work with domain experts in, in their domain. It enables you to get up to speed in their domain and be able to talk one-on-one -on -one and not have to basically get them to tutor you on, on what their problem space is. And then uh, lastly, um, you know, test data, um, extraction and generation. Um, it's, well, I see a lot of projects, there's this sort of this curve where the project starts out and you have to get some scaffolding. You have to get like, basically get the project off the ground. Uh, you have to get some test data. Getting all that stuff set up is way, way faster using a chat LLM model. Um, it can you basically describe stuff and you can get a project going in, in a couple hours that might take you know, uh, you know, a week or more in another, another situation. So when we talk about prompt engineering, I've heard this term, people say that it's, oh, this is an upcoming job. I don't really, I don't, personally, I don't think it's really a job, but I definitely think it's a skill and probably should, it's more on the order of like, you know, a, a class you would take in college um, and a, probably takes about that amount of time to get good at it. So, you know, 10 weeks of, you know, full-time concentration and you would be pretty damn good at prompt engineering and be able to blow the doors off anybody else who just walks up and tries to use these models without, without any training. But really it boils down to how to ask a question. And I, I think it's, it's kind of ironic that um, you know, these, these chat models come up and we're programmers, we solve problems, we're very technical, and then 
you know, some programmers might look down on the, the liberal arts and the people that use words all the time. And now the people that use words all the time might have an advantage against programmers because they're going to be able to formulate questions in ways that we're not used to. So the, the, uh, a, a really good skill is, you know, how to ask questions and how to formulate questions, how to have a theory of mind, how to understand the problems you're solving and the ways they can be solved. Um, back from, you know, Internet 1.0, uh, Usenet, you know, uh, a little bit of the web, all that stuff. So uh, Eric Raymond had, has this um, amazing sort of essay and, and documentation on how to art, ask questions the smart way. Um, and it's copied around a good, good place. This is probably the best resource that links out to some other things. I really recommend this. It talked more about you know, having um, you know, new folks in either a, either a chat channel or a forum. In this case, it was usually email groups. They'd walk up and like, it doesn't work, right? You, well, we're all used to bad bug reports. You could send people that write bad re bug reports the same documentation and, and get them to write better bug reports. But um, basically the same skills that you would use in deep searching or writing good bug reports or writing good questions to get answered on forum boards, all of those same skills translate into being to use uh, chat LLMs. The other thing is like, um, you know, uh, talking about Bloom's taxonomy and knowledge and epistemology and understanding knowledge and uh, philosophy. There's a lot of different things when you're doing research about prompt engineering. Um, that you can you can leverage in in how you would you would generate your your prompts. So I think I kind of think um, a, a funny analogy for prompt engineering is is sort of uh, ETL from an LLM, uh, extract, transform, and load. So you're gonna you're gonna extract some knowledge from the LLM. You're gonna transform it in some way. That's the question and part of the extraction. And then you're gonna load it somewhere else. That's the destination where you target um, how that knowledge is getting delivered to that, to the recipient. And so you can, um, you make a persona, you know, embody the knowledge of a PhD level, you know, programmer, data scientist, somebody in a domain in the use of, this is where you set the context and the kind of tools they're using and the jargon that would narrow the search space um, from that high dimensional space that the LLM occupies uh, down to a, a smaller space. And this sort of grounds the model so it knows where to start from because it is everything. Like it's the, it's the entire internet copied into this model, you have to give it a subset, otherwise it's not gonna have enough context to be able to uh, know what you want. And then the question, we'll go into like, you know, sort of how to segment, how to um, architect and segment questions in some fo following slides. Um, and then the destination is, is how should the model approach the answer? You can tell it, hey, answer the model, answer the question like you're a five-year-old and use analogies. Um, I had one where it was describing the, the latent space of, um, of a model, and it described it as, um, imagine you had a blanket on the ground and you, you threw your Legos out there and you started to cluster Legos by different color and shape, and that that was the latent space. So the things that were similar um, mapped to similar locations within the latent space. I thought that was, I thought that was beautiful. Um, but then you could say, hey, get it to describe like a PhD, and it uses all the mathematics um, that you would expect out of the description. So it definitely can take into consideration the target of, of how it's answering the question. So as I said before, like it's, it's sort of a, a, an analogy or metaphor for, for prompt engineering in terms that we're used to is sort of extract, transform, and load, uh, taking something from the source um, and then processing it and, and deriving and, and sending it to the destination. Um, the uh, prompt engineering is really about clarity and precision of the text that we're sending to the LLM. It's, you're, it's constantly a process of going from a high dimensional space to a lower dimensional space. That lower dimensional space is your answer. The high dimensional space is the whole LLM. And then there's a series of basic filters that do like selection from that space. So you need to have clarity and precision exactly what you're presenting to the LLM. If, if you're sort of rambling and you have too many asides, it's gonna get confused. Um, so, the, and then the context and background information, that's where I said before, in terms of you know, creating the expert, selecting some knowledge out of, out of that dimensional space so that you can, you can present that answer. And then in terms of um, uh, brevity, you, know, you wanna make sure that, you're, that both the answer from the LLM is small enough to fit in the context window. If you're using um, uh, sort of chaining in terms of knowledge that's derived from the LLM, it's, that's gonna feed back into its context window. So you wanna make sure you don't overflow its context window. Current context windows are 4K to 32K. So the, the basics of, of prompt engineering, you're, you're externalizing the, reas the reasoning. So 
terms you might have heard before, step by step, show your work, and chain of thought. Those are ways to get the LLM to show its work and do things so that it can basically write that down while it's processing so that it can use that information in subsequent steps. And then when people talk about zero shot or multi-shot, shots are examples. So again, that's jargon in, L in, in machine learning, but it's really just examples. So you have uh, zero shot, that's where you just ask a question and it answers it. For easy stuff, that's great. If you're doing anything where you need to select data out of a set or um, you need it to rank and you need to give it examples for that, like you're doing sentiment analysis or you're saying, hey, select, select form posts that match this criteria. You give it some, um, a sample of posts that are the thing that you want, maybe something in the middle and the thing you don't want. Um, so that's an example of one few and many shot learning. So prompt engineering, show your work. Um, here's an example of it solving the quadratic equation. We get to show its work, so it, it does it step by step, and then it gets to the final result. Um, you could have put an extra requirement in there to basically do it backwards and evaluate it or g give you an evaluation function that you could copy and paste and make sure that it, it does its work. I find that technique really, really good in terms of um, you know, get it to do some work, but also get it to uh, um, include a test function so that you can quickly evaluate whether it's, it's correct or not. If it's incorrect, you can just tell it it's not correct and it will fix it. Um, the next one, uh, chain of thought, um, which is similar, um, but where you, you ground it, you ask it a question, and then it gives you an answer. That answer goes back into its same buffer. You can then um, go down uh, levels and get it to ask, um, you can ask it more questions about that, that, same, that same topic. If you tried to do it um, basically in, in one question, it wouldn't have enough information in its buffer uh, to be able to answer it. So you, the quality actually goes up when you, you participate in this sort of dialogue aspect. Um, so that the, there's prompt engineering is a huge, huge topic. And the, if you're going to take anything away from this, this presentation, it's that link by Lillian Wang. And that QR code goes to that link. It's just an, an amazing document that goes into excruciating detail, um, yet while not using too many words about prompt engineering. So if you, if you read that documentation, you will, you will be basically have, a, you know, have taken a bachelor's course in prompt engineering. So uh, chat LM is an all-purpose tool that has no analog to what we're doing right now. It can do all of these things. I'm not going to read that slide um, and many more, but it excels at all of this stuff. And especially if it's text-based, if it's a text-based task, it is ideal. Um, and the things that we're going to show right now are you know, extracting data from text, plotting data, uh, generating fake data, um, and then anything else that we can make work. So in this example, um, I had collected, I wanted to make a, a chart of uh, the growth in the number of papers uh, for machine learning that are posted to archive. So the first one is a link to the archive by year, so that's uh, 2022. And in 2022, there are you know, approximately 28,000 papers posted to archive just for in the machine learning. Um, and I've removed all the, you know, the rest of the, the URLs, but under that gist, it actually has the whole sort of analysis of that, and I wanted to project out like how many papers there were going to be next year. So the prompt I used, which I'm not going to go over, but it's basically like, hey, you know, extract out this data and turn it into a pandas data frame, and I'd like you to plot it. And it generated this, and that was there was nothing I needed to fix. It just generated this chart for me, um, and that so that and that whole process of me. This the first time I just copied and pasted the URLs and extracted the information out and had to generate this chart. Um, I want to say it took me about 15 or 20 minutes from having the idea and noodling with it and using it the first time. Um, and if you take notes, which I suggest everyone does, is basically have a nice log of everything um, that uh, you'll save this in your, in your own sort of quiver and be able to run this thing um, much quicker in the future. Uh, and so uh, the next thing I'll show is basically how to take this um, in a, new, in a new, uh, new context and generate this chart. Um, and everything here was machine generated except for that, that um, the thing that says the, the transformer paper that I did that in the slide deck. So I gave it this code, this code it had generated before. Everything that um, was in that chart was derived from this and this was completely machine generated. I then um, you know, asked it to uh, you know, modify the chart so I can see 2017. Uh, it gave me this. I then went through this series of prompts um, to generate that final chart. This was all uh, basically a dialogue where I would get a result back. It would give me the code. I'd evaluate the code. I'd ask it to change it. Um, and in the end, um, that code that we see here um, now became 
becomes uh, the code you see here. And this entire time, there weren't any errors. But if there are errors, you just ask it to fix it. I see some people, when they're using these things, um, they start to do manual fix-ups. You don't really want to do that. You want to just get it to fix the problem, because then you can continue the conversation. And then you, 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 know, um, you get to this state. Uh, so in, in generating data, Let's say you have a system that processes um, you know, METAR reports, and you need a specific um, group of METAR reports. It's, a, it's weather data in a very sort of uh, terse, compact format that's originally meant to go over the radio. Um, here I give it a prompt to say I want some METAR reports for a specific location for a specific weather pattern over this time range, and it generated this. And now I get uh, for that airport code over that time range, and it generated um, weather data. This is probably it doesn't need to be super high fidelity. This is probably good enough for a lot of cases. It shows an example of being able to generate test data for exercising some code. You know, it just takes a couple seconds to get to this. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is, is hallucinations. And people say, oh, it lies, it hallucinates, it makes up data. Completely true, it does. Um, part of that is in the prompts that you write, and then also in the sparsity of the information that you're trying to deal with. If the machine learning model doesn't have enough training data um, to represent the data that you're either querying for or looking for, it will start to basically um, you know, fantasize or hallucinate about points in the latent space that don't exist. Sometimes I think in, in, the, in what I've come across uh, the, in, in its hallucinations, those things should exist. I asked it about like, you know, command line switches to a program, and it said, oh, you can do this, and that didn't exist. And I'm like, well, it really should. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can use those other prompts where um, it puts more of its information into the context window, and that can use to sort of you know fact check itself while it's running. Um, you know, trust but verify. You know, don't use it. I right now I would probably would not use these systems as the last layer or even the second to last layer. But in the development process, it's ideal because that's the first layer, and it still has to filter through you and do your work. Um, but that uh, it's an amazing tool to, to help you get those things done. And I also recommend uh, this essay um, by Harry um, Frankfurt uh, on bullshit. It's available for free. You can buy it. It's 10 bucks. It's a wonderful book. It's a quick read. You'll give it to somebody else, and you will understand you know, the sort of the mind of the bullshitter. Um, so you know, LLMs are probably not a mind, um, and they, don't, they, don't, they probably weren't trained to lie, but you could train one to lie. Um, so they don't really have a concept of the truth or not. So that's on us to be able to determine um, whether things are correct that come out of them. I would not you know, uh, copy and paste facts out of, out of a chat transcript and, and you know, send it out on the internet as truth. We've, there's, a, there's court cases going on about that same thing right now. And there's a bunch of other research that's happening right now about you know, LangChain and AutoGPT and using multiple LM models and feedback loops. Um, that's all new stuff, but the examples I showed um, are usable right now. So things I've um, witnessed it um, doing is you know, hallucinating about paper titles, software packages, flags for programs, um, you know, something that should exist if it sounds plausible, um, if it's something that somebody would just make up off of the cuff if they were a bullshitter, if you read, that, if you read the essay. Um, you know, long tail information, rare events, things that are sparse in the, in the large language model. So you can, you can ask it to double check its work. If you think you're in doubt of something, you can, be just, you can just ask it, are you sure? And it will actually, you know, half the time it will go back and check to see whether that thing actually makes sense. It'll be like, oh, yeah, you're right, and then, and then fix it up. Um, you can provide more grounding in your prompts so that there's uh, a stronger place for it to start answering from. And then also uh, more constraint in the output. So it has less leeway um, in, in being a little bullshit. Um, I will s uh, so in conclusion, um, they're OK at, at great many things, way more than we are. Uh, you're an expert in your domain. Leverage your domain expert expertise, but allow it to help you in areas that you're not great at. You know, jQuery, uh, JQ processing you know, files, charting stuff, pandas data frames. You know, all that, it's like basically executable documentation. Um, and so it, and it reduces the cognitive load. And that concludes my talk. <laughs>